So those are the political systems. But where are they at? <laughs> and what are the regional and global trends for governance here in the 21st century? Ha! Let's start with the global trends. Friends, there has been a serious and significant shift to the left in the last 100 to 200 years in a ginormous way. I'm thinking specifically of multi-party states, representative democracy is all the rage in today's world. It is the soup du jour, the flavor of flaves. Everybody's been getting on that bandwagon. Representative democracy. They're not alone though. There has been experimentation with other forms of government from the left in the last couple hundred years too. I mean, how you think of communism, uh, that was kind of invented and evolved by Marx and Engels in the last 150 years and then experimented with across Europe and the world in the last 80 to 90 years. Of course, it all failed, but it's the idea that there was these things from the left, that people wanted to embrace the left, that wanted to free up political power for the peoples. That's been the major trend. Now, why would that be? Am I suggesting that these systems like communism and democracy are brand new and so that's why they're just now popping up? Well, not really. I mean, people were talking about democracy and even communism a couple thousand years ago. You think about Socrates and his bunch hanging out in the Athenian city-state doing some sort of democratic talks. And yes, there was components of democracy in different parts of the world for very short periods of time, but they really have not been embraced and done and done well and done for long periods of time until right now. Why did these systems suddenly just crop up in the last couple hundred years? Both communism and democracy in its modern form uh, have evolved in response to monarchy, to the consolidated, concentrated power that monarchy had for most of human existence. I already told you this. You at any point in time over the last 10,000 years, you probably would have lived under some sort of state of monarchy or some other rightist system like a theocracy or a monarchy-theocracy combination or an open dictatorship. Systems on the right have prevailed for most of human experience. And people kind of in the modern era got tired of that crap. And people started to look around and say, a dude pulled a sword from a stone and that's what we're basing political power off of? We're not doing that crap anymore. Somebody think of something else. Let's, let's experiment. Let's dabble with democracy. Let's invent communism. Let's do something else to free up political power to the masses. So that is the big global trend, the shift to the left that really kind of got launched with the American Revolution and the French Revolution and all sorts of European revolutions. And then communism was dabbled with for the last hundred years, but it failed and most of those states then went to some sort of representative democracy. So it is the major system employed today on planet Earth, systems from the center left. But don't count out the right just as yet. As I've suggested, <laughs> It's been large and in charge for most of human history, and there are certainly a whole lot of rightist regimes still out there. A whole lot of one-party states, military governments, open dictatorships. And in today's technologically adept modern world, a lot of elements from the right have found it even easier to hold on to that consolidated power with the use of mass communications or spying or satellites and lots of other things. You see that dictators in today's world actually have it easier to hold on to power than they did a thousand years ago. So the right may be down, but they certainly are not out. And speaking of where the right and the left systems are, those are the big trends for the world. Where are they specifically? This is a map of political systems in today's world. And I'm going to go through the legend very briefly for you here as you look at it, gaze upon it, soak in all of those colors and start to establish some trends that you can see, some patterns. The ones in the dark green are democratic governments, well-established multi-party systems. Now, what does that mean? It means that these are democracies that have been around for a while and are functioning and functioning well. For a while typically means anywhere from 50 to 100 to 200 years. And functioning well means that they have transitions of power which occur peacefully and regularly with no great big fights breaking out. That is much different than the light green colored countries you see here that are attempting to be well-established democracies, but they're not there yet. Either they have not been around for long enough or perhaps that they're not functioning that well just as yet. 
A couple of quick pointers here. You see the former Soviet Union, that's Russia, lots of Eastern Europe, Central Asia. They used to be communist. And then, of course, the USSR imploded and went away 20 years ago. So they have all become democracies just in the last 15 or 20 years. They're new. But if you look at places in Africa, there are states that have been around for 50 or 60 or 70 years as independent states, and they're still lit up in the new category. Why is that? Well, because they've been around for longer, but they're not really doing it that good. I mean, they, they're democracies, but there's a lot of corruption. The elections may not be that free and fair. Coups happen quite frequently. So they're trying, but they're not quite there yet. Next category in yellow is one-party states. Already pointed out Egypt and China is your best examples there. That is a political party like like the Communist Party in China are the ones in charge of virtually all the government seats, which is different from the blue countries lit up as military governments where the dudes with guns are actively the heads of state or in charge of the government functionally day to day. The countries in dark purple are monarchies or theocracies, of course, monarchy, the family line nonsense, which held sway over most of humanity for most of our history, and theocracy, religious states where religious holy folks have the final say in most matters. And that is very, very different from the light purple, which are constitutional monarchies. Let me take a second to explain that because I've not talked about constitutional monarchy. Those light purple countries are functional well-established democracies, all of them, but they've held on to their old figurehead monarchy. And you can see that from Great Britain to Spain, all the way over to Japan and Thailand. These are all well-established democracies, but they still got a king or queen hanging around because all they have is die hard and people like to sip tea with the queen and tip the hat to the emperor and bow down and all that stuff. I mean, Old traditions just die hard sometimes, even when they look silly. So these are well-established democracies, but they still have a figurehead. And let me make this point clear. The figureheads are just that. They're figureheads. They do not have real political power. So the Queen of England is consulted on a host of things, but she does not hold the real political power. Finally, we have in red, transitional or disordered states. Those are pretty much states of chaos, as might be suggested by disordered. These are countries with active civil wars or international wars, places like Afghanistan or Iraq, which they might have something in place, but it doesn't really have real power within the country. Somalia is actually the best case example of this. There is no government at all. There, it doesn't exist. The Democratic Republic of Congo, that big red blob in the middle of Africa, is one that people don't think about a lot because it has a functioning government and they have elections, but it simply does not have real control over the country or the peoples in it. So transitional or disordered states, not really one of one type or the other. They're somewhere in between or just they ain't got a lot of control one way or the other. Now, quickly to regional trends. This gets real easy, particularly if we start with the Western Hemisphere. Sweet, look at that. North America, South America, all the America in between. It's lit up as a democratic government, well-established multi-party system. And yes, launched by the American Revolution and the experiment with representative democracy in the USA, almost everybody on this side of the planet has embraced that. With, of course, one huge exception being Cuba that one party state slash dictatorship of the Castro brothers, which is still the last holdout in the Western hemisphere. Every place else, well-established democracy. Let's jump across the Atlantic though and look at the other regions. If we looked at all of Western Europe and Turkey and Australia, New Zealand and India, South Korea and Japan, yeah, those are all very well-established democracies too. But of course, do note in Western Europe and Japan, some of those are lit up in the light purple. They have the constitutional monarchy. They still have their emperor, king, or queen hanging around. Over in Eastern Europe, as we've already now suggested, with the demise of the Soviet Union, Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia, most of those are newbies to the whole democratic thing, so they're in the light green. Russia itself, I do want you to jot this note down, may be leaning back towards a one-party state. And this is where it gets really tricky. Russia is a functioning democracy. Let me make this clear. They're a functioning democracy. They've only been doing it for about 15, 16, 17 years now. So they're still in the newbie category. But under the leadership of an extremely popular leader, one Vladimir Putin, 
he and his predecessor have consolidated a hell of a lot of power to their single political party, which is so overwhelmingly and rapidly popular that virtually everyone in the country votes for this one political party. And this is where it gets tricky. Because when you start to have one political party that has all the seats in Congress and the presidency and the prime minister, yet you're looking at something closer to a one-party state. But Vladimir Putin would say, hey, they elected us. There are other options out there. No one votes for them. So you see where you get into this fine line. Is Russia leaning back towards a one-party state on the center right, or are they going to stick with the representative democracy center left? That's up to them to call, and it changes from year to year. Right now, too close to call. We're going to keep them in the new democracy category because they are trying. In the Middle East, you have mostly rightish regimes, and this is where the big holdout of the right still exists on planet Earth. You have lots of monarchies, theocracies, military government, one-party states all across the Middle East. Yes, yeah, some new democracies, uh, but even there are new and not really functioning so well in lots of countries. Sub-Saharan Africa is a patchwork quilt of fun. Most of those countries are still considered newbie democracies for reasons I've already alluded to. And they also have disordered states like Somalia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and perhaps some dictatorships like in Zimbabwe. So again, a mixed bag there. And speaking of mixed bags, you also have mixed bags in South Asia and in Southeast Asia, where you have a lot of big democracies like India, like Thailand, like the Philippines, but you also have Pakistan, which is bordering on disordered state, and even Burma, they're a military dictatorship. So mixed bags there. And we'll end on Central Asia and East Asia, the kings of the one-party state. China, its one party being Communist Party, is a one-party state, along with North Korea, which is one-party state slash bordering on dictatorship slash bordering on insane asylum under Kim Jong-il. But don't forget, you got South Korea in there as well, a well-established democracy. That is the regional and the global trends of governance here in the 21st century right now. And now that we've seen the how and the what and the where when it comes to states, uh, let's turn to the who to check out some of the most important actual leaders in charge of some of the most important political powers in the world. In other words, let's head to the heads of state. <laughs> 